Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again. In today's video, a crazy homeowner association claims that they own my 200-year-old farm. They insist that we are trespassing on our own property and try to evict us from our own land. Here is what happened, let's dive right into the story. The story starts like this. My farm property has been in my family for over 200 years and we have always prided ourselves in being family owned and family run. I won't bore you with a family history lesson, but I do just want to give a breakdown of who exactly lives on the farm right now. I live here with my wife and two kids, my uncle, aunt and three cousins also live here on the farm. Two of the cousins are married and one of those has a single child. This is just to show that it is a large farm and basically the only thing that my family has. Some members decided to leave for health or other personal reasons. My parents live nearby but due to medical issues both currently live in a care facility. The last important family thing to note is that my grandpa died 10 years ago and before that his name was on all the documentation and such. And well, the local HOA has never been happy that we don't want to join them and luckily we cannot be forced to. My family has been here before the HOA, so they are not allowed to make it mandatory for us no matter what they wish. The entire family agrees that they are trash people and not being associated with the HOA is for the best. But then one day they show up with a bunch of cops and claim that we are trespassing on their land and want us evicted. Not a single one of us knows what's going on and a huge huge verbal argument breaks out between everyone. With me talking directly to the HOA leader as my uncle tries to get anything out of the police. Me? Trespassing? We own this land. And we have owned it before you were ever here, so how are we on your land exactly? HOA leader? I have paperwork signed by grandpa that he sold us the farm. Me, we both know that's a load of crap. He hated the HOA more than any of us and wouldn't have sold the farm to you. HOA leader, well, we obviously cannot ask him. And I have the paperwork, so you don't have much to say about this. Me, even if we have to leave today, I promise that this is not over. And you won't like how it ends because we know the truth about all of this. We all knew for a fact that grandpa would not have sold off the farm to the HOA in the first place, even less he would have done it and not told any of us before he died. The paperwork is also super suspicious just at a glance because it claims the sale was two days before he died but for the last week of his life he was stuck in the house with one of us at his bedside the entire time. Even the police that knew my grandpa didn't want to believe the HOA but they did not have much of a choice. They had to legally follow protocol and because of the paperwork we were told to pack some stuff up quickly and then leave our farm. We had no idea where we were going to go because the farm was everything we had. We were lucky enough to have enough friends in the area that were willing to house a couple of us each. During the period of trying to get settled and figure out what to do, we found out what the HOA had planned for our family farm. To change up where the property is, do the construction and everything, you need permits of course. Where we live, those records once the permit is granted are public, so we had been keeping an eye out. They wanted to first of all change the land from farm to residential as well as bulldoze and dig up the entire land. The homes, the barns, the silos, the farmland, just everything. Instead of a farm, they were going to build more houses that would be mandatory HOA residences. They were doing the scummiest thing they could and it was just fueling us to want to stop them. We were on a time crunch because we didn't want anything getting torn down. So we were lucky enough that a law was in place to help stop everything in the meantime. If the land had a legal dispute going on, then it could not be touched until that was resolved. We would have liked more time to plan and get things together, but we got the lawsuit filed and now had the biggest hurdle of all. If we could not prove that the paperwork was forged, nothing else in the lawsuit was gonna matter. Since forgery was an actual crime, we had to do more than a lawsuit and move to have actual charges pressed against them for it. They now had the same amount of time as we did to prepare for this lawsuit, which just made things more intense on our end. We had two things to try and prove a forgery, and if either could hold up in court then we were golden. The first being some old papers with grandpa's signature on them. 
Our lawyer warned us that they would try and say since he was dying at the time, that was the reason it didn't look like his handwriting. The other thing was testimony from doctors and close friends that came to see him at the house. We got letters from them stating that grandpa did not like the HOA and also that a family member was always with him and would be aware of the deal. The issue with that being the HOA claiming we knew about the deal and were pretending it didn't happen. Alone nothing we had was strong enough but together we had a case that raised a few eyebrows. Why the fact it would take them 10 years before coming to claim the property if they were given it a decade ago? Why would he have sold the farm and yet no exchange of funds could be found anywhere? Also the coincidence that he did this on his deathbed where doctors confirmed he could barely hold a conversation let alone sign a contract. It was all too much against them and they were found guilty. The HOA leader was guilty of forgery, trespassing, theft and destruction of property. He had ruined some farmland before they were told they had to stop and we were also granted $280,000 because of the destruction and strain it put on the family. He was sent to jail for only a few years but it sent a big shockwave through the area. The rest of the HOA was scared and the community was mad at them. A lot of families here had history too and knew my family personally. They did not like that we almost lost the farm and blamed the HOA as a whole. All of them wanting out of it, especially since they lost all the saved funds in the lawsuit. The HOA had to disband because of all the outcry against them. They wanted to get a little bit more HOA property and because of that they now have none and a man was sent to prison. When will people learn that messing with a family farm is a mistake that will cost you dearly? And yeah, ripe stars, that seems to be a specialty of many HOAs all over the world. When they are faced with a neighbor that has a farm that is not part of the HOA, they seem to freak out and try whatever they can to get a hold of that farm property. Let me know in the comments what you would have done if the HOA tried to take over your farm. And while you're at it, please don't forget to like the video and maybe even leave a comment Comment because that would help me tremendously. Thank you so much. And the next one is a revenge story. My aunt, now 40, has three kids under the age of 10. At every family gathering, I, 23 male, become the de facto babysitter despite me not wanting to so the adults can drink. It was her birthday dinner yesterday and my mom promised me that I would not have to babysit and that the kids would be at a friend's house. But well, the first step I take into their home is greeted by two ear-splitting screams about how much the kids missed me and one toddlery jodeling. I immediately realized I might have been lied to. Normally I don't drink, huge lightweight, but since this was a special occasion, I had made some plans. So my aunt enters the hall to greet my mom while I reach into my backpack and walk into the living room and crack one out of two 12% Viking beers I special ordered for me and my uncle, he likes weird beer, and we start drinking. About three minutes later my aunt sees the can and starts screaming at me for drinking while watching the kids. I only heard the distant screaming. I repeat my mom's promise and she calls me the R word when they are clearly staying here. So I reach out my hand and say 200 bucks for emergency babysitting and I won't finish this beer. She says hell no. So I chuck the half liter can to the loud cheers and laughs from my dad and uncle. When I'm done I say happy birthday mommy sister with a burp, with my mom just looking hugely embarrassed for my aunt. My designated driver, dad, ends up watching them the entire night instead and I think he might schedule a vasectomy soon. And the next one is another revenge story. So this year I got a new job that has been paying me very well. Therefore for this Christmas I decided to splurge on everyone. In particular I spent a lot of my money on my 9 year old daughter and she deserves it 100%. She has been pushing herself in school, helping around in the house without being asked and always being the kindest soul you will ever meet. However, when my mother-in-law came early in the morning and saw how the gifts under our tree were much more than usual, she asked why. I told her that I bought everyone a bunch of gifts including her and she then proceeded to ask how much gifts I got my daughter and I told her about three big gifts and three mini ones. Apparently this outraged her because she started saying that a 9 year old did not deserve that many gifts and she would be taking away the gift she bought my daughter so that my daughter would not be too spoiled. I told her that was unfair especially since my mother-in-law promised my daughter a doll for Christmas and my daughter was looking forward to it. My mother-in-law said let it be a lesson to my daughter that in life she cannot get all the things she asks for. 
Look, I understand that, but it's not like I shower my daughter in gifts every day, and if anything, Christmas is the day you are supposed to spoil your children. But my wife told me to let it go and it was her mother's gift and therefore she could do anything she wanted with it and her mother agreed saying it was her right. And if we were going to play with that ideology, then so be it. I decided to remove the $600 designer bag I got my mother-in-law, the thing I knew she wanted the most and gave her a $40 robe instead. Once my mother-in-law opened her present, she was disappointed asking if that was all from me because everyone else got increasingly more expensive gifts from me. And I said yes and apologized if I disappointed her, but we cannot always get the gifts we hoped for. This left both her and my wife extremely furious, but hey, the mother-in-law got enough gifts that I wouldn't want to spoil her. And yeah, ripe stars, that is one appropriate malicious compliance on Christmas. If you have ever had any sort of malicious compliance or petty revenge on Christmas, please feel free to let us know about your story in the comments. Either way, the next one is titled Don't Park in My Driveway. Last Saturday our neighbors had a yard sale, there was a decent amount of people that stopped by and they were fine parking in my neighbor's driveway. We live on a very busy street so parking on the road is a nuisance as there is no shoulder and people tend to drive well over the 35 miles per hour speed limit that is posted. To be clear, it's very obvious that this is our driveway on our property. We don't share an easement with the neighbors so this person purposely pulled into our driveway because the neighbors was full from other people at their yard sale. The way he was parked completely blocked both of our cars in so if we needed to get out we couldn't. About an hour into the sale we noticed a car pull into our driveway. I asked my husband if he was expecting anyone and he said that he wasn't so he went outside to see what they wanted. He saw the driver, a passenger and two children get out of the car and walk over to the neighbor's yard sale. My husband called out to the driver of the car and told him he cannot park there and to move his car. He told my husband that he had nowhere to park and the kids were with him and it was too dangerous to park on the street. My husband said he understood but he needed to move the car out of our driveway. The man proceeded to argue with my husband until he finally told him to either move his car or he will call and have it towed. My husband came inside and asked me to call the non-emergency police line to see if someone could come out and ask the driver to move the car out of our driveway. An officer arrived within 10 minutes and my husband explained the situation to him. The other driver began ranting at the officer about not having a safe place to park and the officer told him that it did not matter that he was on our property and he could either move the car or the officer would call to have him towed. The man started screaming curses at my husband and told him that if one of his kids got injured because he had to park in the road, he was gonna sue us. My neighbors, the ones having the yard sale, came over and told us that we were a-holes for making such a commotion over them being parked in our driveway. My husband explained that they were the ones having the yard sale, not us, and that he would have never allowed strangers to park in their driveway because it is just rude. Now my neighbors are badmouthing us to all of our other neighbors. Some agree that we were in the right, but the ones to the immediate right of us are now being cold to us and telling us that we are insensitive and have no sense of community. So Reddit, am I the a-hole or should I have let it go and let the man park in my driveway? And here ripe stars let me know in the comments what you think about this but personally I would say OP is definitely not the a-hole because honestly no one is entitled to parking on your property even if it is only for 5 or 10 minutes or whatever. Maybe I could understand it if the neighbors are like good friends of OP or something but this does not really seem to be the case here. So therefore OP is definitely not the a-hole. Either way, another commenter on reddit said, oh man, I was totally gonna berate you because it's so obvious that you're not the a-hole but I see some other commenters that think you should have let the men park in your driveway because you were not going anywhere and it's only for 15 minutes. So honestly, no one is entitled to park in your driveway without your permission unless it is an emergency vehicle. I am mostly baffled here by how you got the police there in under 10 minutes. Not the a-hole. Comment number 2, not the a-hole at all. If you had an emergency and had to move or even call an ambulance, things could have gotten really bad just because someone felt like they were entitled to park in your driveway. 
I don't understand why people think it's okay to use private property as a parking space. You did the right thing in my opinion and your neighbors who thought it would be okay can offer up their own driveway for parking next time someone has a yard or garage sale. Update to the story, ETA, people keep asking why we called the police. We called them because the driver was becoming increasingly hostile and swearing. He threatened to sue us. We would most likely have let him stay if he had just asked us first. The second he started cursing at my husband, he had to leave. We don't know him, did not know what he would do or was capable of, nor did we invite him. He was there for a neighbor's yard sale that had nothing to do with our property. And the next one is a story from r slash malicious compliance. I worked for a small company for the last two years as a software developer. And with small, I mean that I was the only employee, so for many projects my boss had, I wrote the main part of the code base. In March, I made a mistake in one of the updates and from then on, my boss made it a habit to yell at me at least once every day and tell me how stupid I am. Additionally, he started to call me outside of my working hours to demand fixes for problems that at the most part were his own mistakes. To be fair, my code quality started to go downhill after I had several mental breakdowns thanks to the behavior. At the start of May, he said to me that he doesn't want to fire me, but would recommend that I find another job in the next month. So I applied to several companies and was waiting for the responses when he decided to terminate me nonetheless two weeks later. He wrote a termination letter and sent it to my home address, but did not say a word to me. So I was quite shocked when I received the letter, which stated that I was fired starting July the 1st and that I should take my remaining 20 vacation days, which is the rest of my annual leave in June. But in Germany where I work, the employer is only obliged to give you the rest of your annual leave if you worked more than 6 months in the company for this year. Additionally, an important project which I had been working on since February was due in mid-June and not even close to finished because my boss had prioritized tickets from other projects. So then I wrote my boss that I would like to take the vacation days immediately, as written in the termination, but if he needed help for finishing the current project I would be willing to have the remaining vacation days be paid out to me. As soon as I sent the message I saw in the chat program that he was typing. He answered that the number of vacation days in the letter of termination was a minor spelling mistake and that I only had 6 days left. After a quick chat with an attorney, friend of my parents who started laughing when I told him of my boss's reaction, I wrote my boss a formal mail, in which I informed him that I would definitely take the vacation days as stated in the letter and because the termination also stated that the remaining vacation time will not be paid out, I will withdraw the regarding offer. The next week he grudgingly accepted the 20 vacation days and I will never forget the expression of defeat in his face at the last day when he realized that the project he took a loan for was about to phenomenally fail because I was the only one working on it and he didn't even try to understand how it works. By the way, his slogan always was, as long as it works, I don't care. And the next one is titled, Revenge at the Office. This happened several years ago, but I was thinking about it today because we are putting all the Christmas stuff away in the office where I work. Our office Christmas decorations used to include a goofy wooden reindeer that annoyed one of my co-workers. It was sort of a minimalist abstract thing, maybe about 8 inches tall. I'm not sure what it was about this decoration that bothered her so much, she thought it was hideously ugly and wanted it out of her sight. She had a great sense of humor and we joked around together all the time. At some point it became routine for me to place the reindeer on the middle of her desk when I showed up in the morning, she would gasp when she arrived and throw it in the trash. I would eventually grab it from the garbage and then we would repeat it all the next day and get some laughs. This happened all holiday season until we put the decorations away at the end of the year, in fact it continued for several years in a row. One year I did not pack the reindeer away at Christmas, I held on to it until summer and my co-worker found it on her desk in the middle of July. She appreciated my persistence but decided it was time for her to get the last laugh by taking the reindeer outside and driving over it with her car. After driving over it she even backed up and gave it another go, I could not let it end like that. I took the splintered bits of wood and glued them all back together, she found a now slightly misshapen reindeer on her desk again the next day. She took it away with her at lunch and disposed of it somewhere off property, never to be seen again. For good measure in the months that followed she had occasionally pretended to forget about the episode and asked me, hey whatever happened to that ugly wooden reindeer? 
That next Christmas I was on eBay looking for Christmas presents and by chance I found a nearly identical reindeer. A light bulb went off and I knew it was time for my revenge. I ordered that reindeer, I shipped it to the office, care of my coworker, and it showed up just in time for the holiday. She was rather surprised to get a package and initially thought it was probably a gift from one of her kids. I will never forget the look on her face when she opened it. After laughing for a solid two minutes, she admitted defeat and displayed the reindeer on her bookshelf permanently after that. And the next one is titled Revenge on a Company. I am the maintenance director at an independent senior living center. It is pretty much an apartment complex in which you have to be a senior citizen to reside. We provide three meals a day, housekeeping activities, a bus for transportation and several other amenities to increase quality of life because more times than not they will spend the final years of their life here. Our facility is family owned and orientated, family members of current employees are encouraged to apply for positions. We have one rule in our employee handbook which is ensure resident safety, happiness and prolongment of life. I take my job very seriously and take pride in it, I try to go above and beyond to make them all happy. Each resident during the daytime either listens to the radio, play crossword puzzles or most of the time watch their favorite TV shows. We don't provide television service, each resident has to provide it themselves if they choose. Over the last year there has been a trend of televisions not working in countless units and when this happens they are very upset. When I get a work order for a TV, I go and check it out. Most of the time, there is nothing I can do. If the cable is not cut, everything is plugged in and there is no obstruction to the satellite signal, it's going to be a software issue. When this happens, I install an air antenna until their regular service is fixed. I can call the company and a tech comes out, fixes it and usually within a couple of hours, it stops working again. This is a never-ending cycle of upset residents. Over the course of an entire year I spoke with several supervisors and tried to schedule for someone to come out and go through the entire property with me to address each issue. They were not having that, they wanted me to go to each individual unit and have that particular resident call them. This is almost impossible. A lot of them have trouble hearing and discussing complex matters over the telephone, let alone know the four digit code and the answer to the secret question. One resident was out of service for over 60 days and I demanded that they refund or discount this particular resident properly. They ended up only giving her $20 off which is not even half of a single month's payment. When I spoke with this particular representative, I told them that was not enough and I would be throwing all of their dishes in the dumpster. This is just the tip of the iceberg. These companies have caused significant property damage to the facility, they have run the cokes and the gutters and down the downspouts. Ran cables draped over the sidewalk which is a tripping hazard, installed dishes in the center of courtyards and wherever is convenient for them. All over the property cables are strung out on top of the grass for hundreds of feet and they don't bother to bury any cables. I have discussed this numerous times with the owner of the facility of the last year. The last time I spoke with him about it, he gave me the okay to handle the situation and do whatever needed to be done to fix the issue. My options were limited and the only feasible option I could concoct was using a landline company that did not need a satellite dish. Well, I have officially finished running new cokes to every single unit and a landline company came in and installed boxes and services in each resident's apartment. Residents who have previously had to pay a monthly fee for their television service now get their service free of charge, those that never had service now do. We have saved over 50 residents money every month and all in total over 200 plus now have television service that is included in their rent without any increase whatsoever. This was revenge for the representative talking to Miss T in such a negative and rude tone. And with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you cannot get enough of my content please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.